2010 as a principal senior corporate recruiter. Al comes with over 12 years of vendor management, staffing, and recruitment industries. He's held leadership as well as individual contributor positions. Currently as a senior recruiter, Al manages six locations throughout the U.S. and Europe and handles all of the talent acquisition for NCSOC currently. He's worked with many of the major local companies like Microsoft, T-Mobile, AT&T, Expedia, Starbucks, and Bank of America. He graduated from the University of Maryland and retired after 21 years in the military. Outside of work, Al enjoys traveling, camping, cooking, and music. So, let's welcome him. really quite sure what I'd like to do okay. just yet. Really, uh, um, I'm going to Cascadia for an associate's in integrated studies for now, but I'm planning on going to a four-year college, uh, transferring, so I'm not quite sure yet. Okay. I'd like to figure that out soon. Right. So show of hands, how many people are focusing more on web development? Okay. And how many people are more on the back end software development, you know, hardware, software? First and foremost, to kind of give you some helpful hints as far as what you need to, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the, the trend. Uh, I've seen from a talent acquisition standpoint, a lot of major companies have fluctuated dramatically over the years. And really, you know, obviously with, you know, the economy taking a little downturn, a lot of companies got scared, they backed off. Um, one of the key things is to help provide you some tips to kind of put you above and beyond um, the standard individuals out there that are. A lot of familiar sites that are out there specifically that's going to be targeted to anybody that's in web development or any IT development. Uh, and how many people have heard of Dice? Dice.com? Yes. D E S K? Oh, D I C E? Oh, okay. Dice.com for many, many years has been kind of like the, the front line when it comes to any recruiter looking for resumes of anybody in the IT industry. It could be anywhere from web development, software development. Um, and uh, everybody's heard of Monster. Okay, my thing is stay away from Monster. Uh, Monster has a tendency to have a lot of uh, you know a lot of people out there. From uh, as an example, anybody studying Java here? Okay. So as an example, when a recruiter does a search in any of these databases, you know, with the resume. We utilize this simple word as Java. Well, what will pull up for me from a recruitment standpoint is I can get everybody that's software development in Java or anybody that's worked at a Java coffee shop <laughs> or any name that's associated with that. So those are kind of things that you got to be careful of when you're specifying specific part of your roles that you're looking at. Um, how many people here have utilized uh, or is familiar with the networking site called LinkedIn? All right. I'll give you an update on the trend. I actually went through this with LinkedIn three days ago. Uh, the vast majority of recruiters out there, uh, in comparison, when you're looking at these other sites, 50% of the talent acquisition nationally right now is coming out of LinkedIn. Wow. All right? Where Dice and Monster were big sites for resume databases, uh, these Dice is actually, or Monster is actually being utilized around 10% right now. Comparison to dice may be a little bit higher than that. I think it's like 12 or 13 percent. Um, so 
So if you have a LinkedIn account or if you don't, actively participate in that. That's where most recruiters are going to find you. It's free for most people to get on there. Um, LinkedIn is a great location to have you pretty much build your resume onto your profile. They can do their searches. How many people here are familiar with Boolean searches? All right. How many people know how to use Boolean searches? Okay. Let me just say it this way. I keep a spreadsheet, and it's a tremendous spreadsheet. And, uh, basically, what I do is I, I make up so many varieties of Boolean searches, and I keep track as far as the number of candidates that I can actually obtain by utilizing that search screen. Does that make sense? So I can utilize that within Monster, Dice, LinkedIn, just about any database that has any resumes that are out there. Um, like I said, LinkedIn is probably something that I use 95% of the time. Uh, just as an example, for NCSoft this past year, I probably filled over 110 positions uh, within the organization nationally as well as in Europe. Uh, LinkedIn is now, I think there's 130 million members. So it kind of gives you the visibility and the vast majority of those uh, people that are in LinkedIn are going to be recruiters, talent acquisition managers, anybody that you need to reach in the organization. Uh, so keep that in mind. One of the other things that I would also say is that if you have a LinkedIn account, try to connect with as many recruiters as you can. I can't tell you how often that other recruiters are reaching out to me asking me, do I have anybody in my network that would be a fit? And it's just a quick little search. Pull up names for those profiles directly to the hiring managers, and uh, and they're able to connect with them there. And that's the relationship that you want to build. Um, you know, it's I guess the question that I would have is how many people have heard the term. It's not about what you know, but it's who you know. That's, that's, I can't tell you how true that is. Uh, there's been way too many times that I've found candidates that have a, a match of like 95 percent of all the skill sets that's associated with a specific role. And the manager will hire somebody that has 10% of the skill sets. And I question myself, why is that? It's about who you know. Um, you know, in some cases, when they do interview, uh, you know, it comes down to talking about hard skills and soft skills. The hard skills on your resume is going to basically catch the recruiter's eye. Okay, well, this person has specific components that I'm looking for. Um, I, I interpret a resume more as what is the potential that that person brings. It's going to be a little bit different from most recruiters out there. Uh, a lot of recruiters that are, are heavily in the corporate environment, I mean, I would probably speak to some major corporations like uh, Microsoft, T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, Wireless, uh, Expedia, Starbucks. When they're looking for these type of individuals, uh, they're going to deal with two different recruiters. You're going to deal with the ones that's going to give you a call based on what they see, and they'll have a, probably a list in front of them about anywhere from 10 to 20 questions. Are, which are going to be standard questions that they ask everybody. Um, I'm a little bit different. Um, I get to know who the person is, because that's what's going to be most important. Uh, connecting with the rec recruiter is also going to be very important for you as well, because the more that you're able to know who that individual is or from a human standpoint, the more that that recruiter is going to be able to help you. Uh, and, and I can't tell you how true the fact that that is. Um, Another key thing that I would say is if you're targeting a specific company, do not apply to more than you know maybe two positions within that organization. If you apply to anything that's more than that, but then what ends up happening is then the recruiters or even HR managers or talent acquisition will start to wonder if you really know what you want to do. Wait until you get feedback or a rejection or anything like that prior to applying to any additional roles. Uh,
somebody in my network or I know somebody within my network that knows something else. That's what this, you know, that's what traditional head hunting is going to be about. So, um, so with that being said, uh, if any of you reached out to me and said, hey, do you know, do you have visibility in positions out there that would be suitable? It's easy for me to go in and take a look. You'll also see a lot of people posting a lot of jobs. How many people look at the job jobs that are posted on LinkedIn that have access? And what do you see out there? Pretty much the company, the job description. You can take a look and see who the recruiter is or the person that posted the role. Only on occasion. Only on occasion. There's going to be some recruiters that you're going to approach specifically in regards to a role um, that you may send an invite to and they're not going to accept unless and until they find you as a feasible candidate for that position. What I would always take a look is take a look at who you're connected to that's connected to that person and have that person kind of give them a recommendation for you. Um, that's going to get you on pretty much, needless to say, the top of the pile. And to, if it's coming from another recruiter, other recruiters are more likely to listen to the person that's referring an individual than it would be for somebody that's kind of out of you know, left field that's When would you suggest to actually pay for a LinkedIn membership so you can do the reach outs and the mail outs? You know, it's uh, with LinkedIn, it's, it's there's certain things that are still in development. Uh, there's things that it could probably be improved on that I've seen. Um, you know, you can connect with anybody that you want to at any given time, you know, with a free account. Uh, they have another account, the next step up, where I believe it's like, uh, I can't remember if it was 10 or $20 a month. Uh, that's a doggone good investment because it opens up a little bit more visibility to a lot of things that are out there. Um, unfortunately, the account that I have is about $1,500 a month. And I have visibility to everybody in the world. That's all I can do. Uh, the reason is because I do a lot of recruiting for Europe, you know, in, even Asia, and sometimes I have to find that talent acquisition. As an example, with NCSoft being a gaming company, um, anybody here play online games? Anybody familiar with... Uh, company called ArenaNet. You're familiar with ArenaNet? Of course. Guild Wars. Guild Wars is probably one of the top three online MMO RPG games out there right now. Uh, we're getting ready to release Guild Wars 2. Uh, ArenaNet is one of our studios for NCSoft. So NCSoft, we have three studios. We have uh, ArenaNet, Guild Wars, we have Carbine Studios, which is out of Orange County. They just came out with a game called All Star. In addition to Paragon Studios, which is the, the maker and developer of City of Heroes. Uh, and maybe some people are familiar with Lineage and such like that. And the gaming industry is on such a big boom right now, even for the people that are unemployed. Because when they're sitting at home, what are they doing? They're playing video games. And that's the reality of it. Um, so to, to kind of give you an idea, when I do search for people, just to kind of give you an idea since you're familiar with Guild Wars, we're moving to what's called a free-to-play um, concept. What that means is that instead of having to go to the store, buy the CD, download the CD onto your computer, and, and, and having to pay for it that way, there's a monthly membership fee or whatnot. All of the games with NCSoft is getting ready to go free-to-play. What that means is that anybody can download it for free and play the game. Yes. I thought they just made Lineage for free to, yes. to play for the longest time released, it's been paid uh, for. The team was working until about midnight last night releasing the next version of it, so um, it kind of gives you an idea of how there, there's a huge fault. I can't even talk. No That's a really old people. game. It is. And, uh, but we have Ion, which is out there, and a few other, other things. Uh, but you know, we won't just talk about NCSoft. We'll talk generally about a lot of other companies. But when a company has a need and we're unable to find it here in the U.S., we start going to Europe and, of course, Asia. Free to play being an example, they're looking for a monetization um, producer, which is somebody that knows how to set up uh, the game to the point where when you attract people into the game for free, that at some point when they want to purchase a shield for themselves or a helmet or a sword, that's monetization within the system. So what that means is you can purchase it for you know funding, you know, you can charge to your credit card or whatnot. China has a, has a tendency to be kind of a lead in that area, respectively to the gaming, so gaming stuff. Uh, Europe is certainly taking off tremendously hard right now. Uh, and here in the US, uh, NCSoft is still building that continuous presence on an ongoing basis. Uh, now with that being said, you know, going back to being general with a lot of 
key things that we've realized as recruiters is that we're not always finding the talent that we're looking for here in the U.S. And I'm not sure why that is. Um, you know, but at the same time, a few years ago, when Microsoft was probably one of the biggest people that would sponsor H-1B visa sponsorships, fully people from India and all over the world to come here to work. Um, these days, companies are starting to sway away from that. The reason is, is because we are starting to find more talent here in the U.S. in comparison to overseas, which is really good. Which a lot of people that are going in the direction of computer science, software development, web development, uh, we certainly have uh, a serious need in the U.S. for that. Uh, when it comes to the sponsorships, they cost companies lots of money. A relocation of $4,000 per person for a sponsorship, a period of 20 years, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved, obviously. So, uh, you know, the U.S. only will grant X amount, of, you know, a certain amount of uh, sponsorships for certain companies throughout the year. Anything that um, that may come to mind specifically that I can possibly answer for you at this time when it comes to what individual recruiters are looking for generally, or what I would be looking for in comparison? Yeah. I have a question. When you, uh, a lot of people are coming straight out of college, and I'm coming kind of uh, from a somewhat of a career change in the IT right. industry. What do you see as far as placement to companies like NCSoft and companies like that? That a lot of their products are very high end. Do they have positions for people who are either starting new or are shifting over? I've actually implemented a program with all three studios for internship programs. Looking for students that are straight out of school to come in and do internship, really learn from the guys. Um, Technology is always changing. And sometimes by the time that you, you graduate, you could be a little bit behind the power curve a little bit. I mean, obviously, I think that they try to keep up with training industries. But I mean, as a recruiter, I'm not a, I don't have an IT background, but I've learned a lot. Wikipedia and Google is my friend. Um, if I don't know something, I'll definitely do the research. Um, you know, when it comes to questions, uh, uh, there's a website that I used to go to, and I don't know if it's still up, but it's, it's called itinterviewquestions.com. <laughs> and for any recruiter, it's pretty helpful for us to go in because, as for, for example, uh, use a company I worked with in the past who's familiar with Bolt. Okay. Bolt is a big heavy hitter in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, they've got to be the biggest firm that's out there. I mean, they're big on a national standpoint. Uh, I worked for them. Um, you know, with Bolt, it, it's going to be, I would say, how many people have actually worked with a staff company? All right. That's a really good move. Work with, with as many as you can. Put them all to work for you. Because you know what, it shouldn't really be that difficult for you to have to go out and look for a job. Let the professionals find these positions. Uh, at Bolt, I actually supported uh, well, Russell Investments, it used to be Frank Russell, uh, Warehouser, uh, World Vision down the Federal Way. Anybody familiar with that organization? Uh, as well as a, a couple other major companies. Uh, but to kind of go back to your question which was well, how, how, how would it work for somebody that's in a transition? Well, availability out there too. You know, it's, there's a lot of companies that are trying to move in that direction because they look at it as kind of a standpoint of, you know, getting somebody that's fresh out of school, training them the way that they want to be trained or how they want them to be trained, you know, and getting them familiar with whatever software stack that they have within an organization, which every organization is going to be completely different. Um, you know, the reason why I kind of focus on Bolt from that standpoint is Bolt has visibility to a lot of those with, gosh, I think for this, almost every company here in the same Northwest. Um, you know, it, it, it's a matter of building that relationship with that recruiter and making sure that person's keeping their eye out for you specifically. Um, with NCSoft, I think right now, at Paragon in Mountain View, California, I have about eight uh, interns that are down there. School, just to go in and actually get practical application experience uh, within the team. And I think that there's two of them right now that are in the process of getting converted to full time because they recently graduated. But they have been in that program for a period of six months. The team's comfortable with them. 
obviously you don't want to go anywhere you know, later on. Um, that's that's a pretty good way. You know, that's your opportunity to get in and kind of prove to them you know that you have the, the will, the tenacity to, to join that team and, and you know blend in well. Um, you know, aside from the technical skills, it really comes to a soft skills standpoint. So when you go from an initial phone interview, which could be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the manager, then we focus on the hard skills first. Keep in mind, when you do go in for the in-person interview, it's all about personality. So. Any other questions? Sure. Um, by the interview, where are you sitting on the interview? It's much an interview with the company or being interviewed by. That's, the, that's yeah. one thing I would highly suggest to anybody. Is when you are interviewing, just keep in mind, they're not interviewing you. Put it in your head that you're interviewing. You've got to make a decision whether that's the place you can be at. Uh, and you're going to be able to express that during the process of interviewing. The person that's going to interview you is going to be probably the manager or the director that's going to be supervising you. So keep in mind, you know, put it on them, put it on their side. And that's what I do. Right. You know, and uh, not only does it really show a level of confidence, it's like, you know, why do you want to? You know, what is it that I can bring to contribute to the, to the organization? A lot of managers have sat in, you know, and every interview is going to be different. There's managers that, there's managers that try to play kind of like a good cop, bad cop. So there'll be multiple people in the time. Uh, and in most cases, the funny thing is that I, that I, you know, sometimes when I do sit in some of these interviews, it's interesting to me to find out the specifics as to what this manager is looking for. Um, how many people look, have looked at a job description and actually said, Oh gosh, you know, I need almost everything, but I just don't have that degree. Has anybody done that? All right. Every company, every job description to me, I will tell you is a wish list. And I express that to every manager. You know, uh, the manager will send me a full page document, sometimes two pages, of everything that they want. You know, and the first question when I do what I call a quality check is I have a meeting with that manager, and I flip the, you know, look at the job description, I flip it over, and I say, Tell me verbally what is it that you want. It was, tell me verbally what, what is it that you want. And in most cases, what they tell me verbally is definitely not as long as that page to you know, two page document. Um, so, I mean, working with recruiters, if a recruiter's not doing their due diligence to really having that relationship with the manager and taking you as a candidate and understanding what the specifics of what you're looking for, because I can tell you, every candidate that's submitted, it doesn't matter who. I have a summary as far as my notes, my understanding of what the candidates wants and needs, and how they qualify for the position. Um, and you've got to be able to have a recruiter that's going to be able to do that for you. As an example, um, you know, you have uh, certain individuals that, you know, the difference between Oracle and SAP. Well, they both function in the same capacity, just different companies or two different products. But the person that's pretty much focused in SAP, you know, can obviously be Oracle even though they may not have any experience with it. So those are the things that I take a look at when I look at a candidate's resume and say, hey, th this person doesn't have Oracle, but they're coming from a background with SAP, which kind of works in a similar capacity, from a reporting capacity, whatever it may be, business intelligence, whatever. Um, and you've got to have somebody that's going to be able to sell that thought concept to higher managers. So, does that help answer your question? Yeah, well, yeah, I was just answering here uh, about the uh, reading a great job description and it gets down and says requirements, BS degree. Well, I have one. And I don't waste my time with that. Yeah. Well, should I? Should I send my resume to them and just hope that maybe that's not a requirement? Or just I would say there. that you know it's good to apply for those positions. Um, any good recruiter will tell you that in most cases, I would rather have somebody that has tangible experience than have them degree. Hmm. Cool. I mean, I mean that's. That's just me, but I'm, I'm going to be one of probably 10, 000, tens of thousands of recruiters in this area that's going to view it that way. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it comes up all the time. You know, and, and like I said, you know, it really depends on your relationship with your, your recruiter and how that person is actually going to represent you. you got to think, think of it this way. You know, you have uh, sports agents out there that are making a ton of money representing specific individuals, football players, baseball players, whatever it may be. You gotta look at the recruiter that way as well. Not that the recruiter's gonna make a huge compensation off of that. In some cases, they might. Um, but you need somebody that's gonna represent you. You gotta be comfortable with that. 
so that uh, not having a DCS is uh, just, it's a bit of a little more kind of You know, it can be, depending on the organization that you're targeting. You know, uh, I know that Microsoft is, you know, you better have it. <laughs> Otherwise, you can bypass it. In some cases, you got to understand that within large organizations like that, that whatever talent acquisition tool that they're utilizing, when people can apply for the position, It'll automatically filter through the resumes and what's listed in the resume. And if it doesn't see specific things, it'll automatically bypass the resume and move on to the next one until it finds what it's looking for. Um, there's a new thing that's starting to come out. And, uh, I think LinkedIn is starting to do it in addition to a few other companies. Bolt was the first place that I've ever seen it. And they do what is called a conceptual search. Anybody heard that term before? No. A conceptual search is basically, you know, you take a job description load it into the system, and basically it will go through the whole database, and some databases are connected to Dice, Monster, some other you know, websites out there that, you know, Career Builder, you name it. And what it will do is it will pull a bunch of resumes in, and then to the recruiter say, this person has a 98% match to the job description. The other way of doing it is that some managers I've seen where they'll provide, I want to find somebody just like this person. And they'll provide a resume upload that resume and the machine does the same thing. It, it provides individuals that comes to the closest match to that individual. And that's where recruiters start. Um, unfortunately, in NC South, we don't do that. You know, uh, I think it's great. A conceptual search gives you an idea of what you're targeting, but it's not always going to capture the your right people. There's going to be flaws. Um, so if anybody can develop something, Too many managers reject people that have master's degrees 
that you know recently graduated with a master's degree. Um, the reason is that they're too scared to approach those individuals. They're, they're scared of the fact that well, this person has a master's, they're probably more qualified than I am, um, and uh, they're not going to be here for very long before they get that huge job opportunity and they're going to be gone. Um, one to kind of answer your question is that you know, when you're making a transition, it's about convincing hiring managers that that's going to be the right decision. Probably the best route. Um, structuring your resume, you know, in some instances, depending on what kind of job that you're targeting, I would say leave off your past history and try not to date too many things. Um, there's things where I've seen where, you know, with certain organizations, all of a sudden, because this person's listing something that goes all the way back to 1982, you know, they'll be disregarded for that, which that bothers me a lot. Talking about like age discrimination, I mean, you don't want to provide any visibility of that. What I would say is tangibly have anywhere from the past seven or eight years' experience because whatever you've done in that time period is going to be most liable. As an example, if I ever left recruiting for a period of say a year just to do something different, for me to come back into recruiting is going to be problematic. I mean, just for being out of it for a year. And the reason is because IT technology is always constantly changing methodologies as far as finding those individuals are constantly changing and so I'll have a whole bunch of tests to do in order just to be able to get to that point. Um, to answer your question, I mean it's it's a it's a unless if they're looking for somebody that's junior and you have all the skill sets, look as much as you can at the very beginning of the resume. Some people put a lot of the education and stuff towards the end, which is fine. Um, but when you're talking about your tangible skills that you're learning here school, you know, either if it's software development, web development, make sure you emphasize as much as you can within the first half of that resume. If you don't, you can get bypassed. How long does it, all right, I'm going to take an idea here. How many people have reviewed other people's resumes in the past? Okay. How many, when you're reviewing somebody else's resume, how much time do you spend looking at that resume? Should I say anybody over longer than 15 minutes?